From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Anne-Marie Hordern, I'm Joe Matthew. Speaker Johnson's plan to avoid a shutdown is out, with mixed reactions from both sides of the aisle. He promised to bring it to the floor tomorrow. President Biden keeps his options open. I'm not going to make a judgment on what I'd veto and what I'd sign, but let's wait and see what they come up with. With Senator Tim Scott's departure from the Republican presidential candidates field, where do the cards lie now? We'll discuss all these stories with Libby Cantrill, PIMCO's managing director and head of public policy. And as funding for Israel stalls in Congress, what effects is that having on the war between the country and Hamas? We'll speak with Israel's economic minister, Nir Barakat. Joe, happy Monday. Yes. It is an incredibly you, busy week. On it. domestic front, foreign policy front, President Biden, remember everyone's been waiting with this meeting happen between right. Xi Jinping and President Biden. First time in a year. Then we have CPI data tomorrow, inflation, what is really driving the polls for his numbers at home down. Absolutely. And then potentially, we are back here again, deja vu in Washington. There mm -hmm. is a potential for another government shutdown. Yeah. But not another one. They avoided it at the last minute. Well, that's right. And we're, we've got less than a week here to count down. I know you're getting on a plane to chase the president at his uh, meeting out west this week, but we're going to be counting down here in Washington all the while. And we heard about it today from the Senate Majority Leader. Of course, the Democratic view here on a continuing resolution emerging in the House. Chuck Schumer talked about it on the Senate floor. I've said on multiple occasions that if we're going to work together to keep the government open, Speaker Johnson will have to avoid pushing steep cuts or poison pills that Democrats can't support. For now, I am pleased that Speaker Johnson seems to be moving in our direction by advancing a CR that does not include the highly partisan cuts that Democrats have warned against. The Speaker's proposal is far from perfect, but the most important thing is that it refrains from making steep cuts while also extending funding for defense in the second tranche of bills in February, not the first in January. Joining us now, Bloomberg's Texas Bureau Chief, Julie Fine, and Jonathan Tamari of Bloomberg Government. Jonathan, let's start with you. I know you're tracking this very closely. Mm -hmm. Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy said over the weekend that given what he heard from Speaker Johnson and his plan he outlined, there's only a 30 percent chance of a shutdown. But now we hear from Senator Schumer, who's saying, well, it doesn't have the poison pills. They, it looks like the Democrats can swallow this. Do you think that this means this plan will avoid a government shutdown? They're leaving the door open to it. I think that everybody's still kind of assessing and waiting to see what the final bill looks like, but they're certainly not slamming the door. You saw Senator Schumer say that he's pleased with some aspects of it. We saw President Biden saying he's open to it, which is a big change in tone from what his press secretary said last week. Uh, Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries in the House has said that they're evaluating it. So they're not fully embracing it, but the fact that Democrats aren't slamming the door on this proposal does suggest that there's a path here to get to a solution if Johnson can guide it through his conference. The big question is he's getting already some pushback from the far right wing of his, of his party. Can he sustain that? Will he accept that flack uh, if it means getting Democratic votes and avoiding this shutdown at the end of the week? That's where I was going to go here. It looks like he will need Democrats to some extent. I talked to Chrissy Houlihan today, a Democrat from Pennsylvania. She said she hadn't decided. And I suspect that we're all waiting to hear from Hakeem Jeffries. Will there be a call tonight or tomorrow morning, a meeting in which he says, go for it, Democrats support this? Because we're talking about a potential floor vote tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, I think there's two ways it could happen. There'll certainly be a Democratic meeting. They're all flying in for a vote this evening. Yeah. They'll have a meeting in the morning. It could be that he says, yes, we need to support this to avoid a shutdown. Or it could just be that he says, you know what? Vote your conscience. I'm not going to tell you how to vote. And there are some number of Democrats who will say, you know what, I want to avoid a shutdown at all costs. I will support this, even if many Democrats oppose it. The question is, how many Democratic votes are going to be needed? Yeah. Um, and will they be there if Hakeem Jeffries doesn't necessarily push people? And that question is needed because Speaker Johnson is not getting potentially all the votes he needs on the Republican side, especially Absolutely. from the hard right. Representative Chip Roy spoke earlier today about opposing this plan. For the same reasons that, you know, I opposed the CR on October 1st, I opposed a CR that uh, 
the current speaker, Speaker Johnson, is putting forward because it continues to perpetuate the very system my, my constituents sent me here to oppose. They don't want me to continue spending money we don't have at $1.6 trillion spending level, at the Pelosi spending level, the Pelosi spending policies and, and priorities. Julie, aren't we back to the same exact position that Kevin McCarthy was in, the former speaker, and then he got ousted for? Well, we're in a very similar situation, but here's what's different here. Some hardliners, like you just saw, Chip Roy there, are concerned about it, will express concern, may definitely vote against it. However, this is a speaker that the hardliners wanted. So he may have the grace of just beginning the job, and they may work a little bit harder to make sure it makes it through the finish line. Well, talk to us for a minute more about Chip Roy. The gentleman from Texas uh, brings a few other lawmakers with him. How, how much of the party do we think he's speaking for here? Well, I think at this point he's not speaking just for himself. He probably wouldn't have gone out there and done that, but he may not have a large group with him. We know there are a certain number that are already saying, yes, we're going to vote against that. We've seen that in the past. Some do come mm -hmm. forward and change their minds as this goes on, as you know that this is a situation that is ever changing. This is similar to what Kevin McCarthy was in. However, there were people that wanted to get rid of him from day one. I think there may be a little bit more grace right now with Mike Johnson. We also have to talk about some pretty um, unexpected news yesterday evening. And I say unexpected because the <laughs> clip of Senator Tim Scott suspending his campaign on Fox, the anchor looked confused. The anchor, of course, is a former lawmaker who he's supposedly very good friends with in Trey Gowdy. And I wasn't sure uh, if he was more surprised than I was at the moment. You'd think that he might have gotten a tip off on that. Right. Should we, that should he's going to well? break massive news yeah. and he wasn't aware. Yeah, let's roll it. I love America more today than I did on May 22nd. But when I go back to Iowa, it will not be as a presidential uh, candidate. I am suspending my campaign. I, I think the voters uh, who are the most remarkable people on the planet have been really clear that they're telling me uh, not now, Tim. Julie Fine, the look was everything, actually looked stunned. And you don't really see that, I feel like, a lot on cable news. What, what does well, this I mean think... now for... <laughs> oh, go for it. I think one thing is clear. You don't want to play poker, or you do want to play poker with Trey Gowdy, for sure. The man has no poker face. It's a little bit surprising. Seriously, you've got to think you know that in advance. If not, I mean, he did an excellent job of appearing stunned. It's just not something you see before. I think that the senator was like, I'm not going on the debate stage again. Look what just happened to me here. So he decided this is the right time to get out of the race. Whether he decided at that exact moment or there was thought behind it, that's something that'll take some time to figure out. Well, we've got a big conversation going now about where does where does the, the Tim Scott money go? Where do the, the, the percentage points in the poll go? He didn't have that many. And a lot of folks are looking to Nikki Haley, yeah. who's dropping $10 million dollars on a big ad buy, it's TV, radio, and digital going into the uh, caucuses and into New Hampshire. $10 million is five times what Ron DeSantis is spending here. And Jonathan, I wonder what that tells us, maybe more about Ron DeSantis than Nikki Haley right now, but you know, the trajectory of these two campaigns are taking on two different directions. Yeah, and, and the Senator Scott dropping out, of course, relates to Nikki Haley because they're both from South Carolina. So you have Absolutely. to think they have a lot of donors and supporters in common. People who supported Senator Scott certainly are going to know Nikki Haley. And yes, yeah, she is the person on the upward trajectory. And that establishment wing of the party has been looking for somebody to consolidate around. Mm -hmm. People thought it was going to be Ron DeSantis. But at the moment, it looks much more likely to be Nikki Haley. And that spending is only going to, you know, money attracts more money. So the fact that she's putting that out there is going to be attractive to other donors in the party as well. And she's having a, a huge, well, she's meeting with a number of huge Wall Street don donors this week. We've scooped that she's going to be in New York. She's mm -hmm. sitting down with the likes of Gary Cohn. He's co-hosting this, uh, this event for her. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, Jonathan, even though there's a lot of momentum, it feels like, behind Nikki Haley, it's the tale of two primaries. It, there's and one... Sh standout winner. That's the former president. That's right. I mean, momentum is relative here, right? We're talking about very a fraction of the percent that Donald Trump has. And it's the continuing split between the donor establishment class of the Republican Party and the base of the Republican Party. And the establishment class has made clear they don't like Donald Trump. The base has made clear they love Donald Trump. And the base has consistently won that fight. And 
they are still so far. Uh, even if Nikki Haley was to consolidate all of the other support in the party, she still might not be able to defeat Donald yeah. Trump. Well, we'll see how many are still standing by the time we do the next debate. Our thanks to Julie Fine and Jonathan Tamari for a great conversation. Coming up, we'll dive into the odds of a government shutdown just days away, potentially, with PIMCO's Libby Cantrell. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg. the appropriate answer right now. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. Congress has this pop, this uh, ability to sort of move at lightning speed or at glacial speed. And I hope that lightning speed, uh, effective lightning speed will be that choice this time. Congresswoman Chrissy Houlihan of Pennsylvania offering her thoughts on this proposed stopgap budget plan put forth by Speaker Mike Johnson. She spoke with me earlier today on Bloomberg Sound On. So are the odds of a shutdown lower than they were before the weekend? A lot of folks think so including Libby Cantrell, PIMCO's Managing Director, Head of Public Policy. It's great to see you, Libby. Welcome back, as always. You know, most people just want to hear that everything's going to be all right. Could you tell our viewers today that that's the case? Everything is going to be all right, Joe. Uh, it really, we, <laughs> we really that. expect everything, everything to be all right. Now, we're not always saying that, uh, but in this instance, uh, we are. We think that um, this, what was, what was unveiled over the weekend, effectively a clean stopgap bill that just funds the government until these sort of two different dates, January 19th and then February 2nd, sort of depending on the area of the government it funds. Um, this is, I, you know, I would say this is a kind of a victory for moderates, for even Democrats who um, want to see the government funded, funded who want to go home uh, very uh, importantly, for both the Thanksgiving and for the for the holidays in in December, um, and who will want to sort of delay this fight, and this is effectively what it does. I think the real question, however, uh, is can Johnson sort of assuage uh, the um, the sort of understandable and and expected resistance among his right flank and keep his gavel if this is what in, in fact happens, which is. He, uh, Johnson, pulls up, the, puts up this bill on the floor. It passes with the majority of Democratic votes, uh, passes the Senate, and gets signed into law. Again, ironically, uh, as, just to remind people, this is exactly what Speaker McCarthy did uh, at the end of September <laughs> that just got him ousted. So, you know, in some ways, uh, we've been telling our clients, uh, same menu, different waiter. Uh, the same dynamics are very much at play here. In order to pass something that's going to get Senate signed into law, you sort of have to work with Democrats, particularly because the Senate is controlled by, by Democrats. Um, so that dynamic still prevails. So I think the big question here is, can Johnson do this uh, and keep his speaker gavel? We think so. So yes, long way of saying we do think everything will be all right, at least in the short term. Well, Libby, we also heard from President Biden earlier today address the shutdown in the Oval Office. I want you to take a listen to what he said. I understand that uh, the new Speaker of the House has a proposal. It's being negotiated with the minority leader of the House and Senator Schumer and, uh, and uh, the uh, Republican leader are also talking about it. I don't know what the outcome is going to be. I'm not going to make a judgment what I'd veto, what I'd sign, but let's wait and see what they come up with. I'm confused, Libby, about the White House's response, because over the weekend, they were talking about how the Republican Party is reckless with this laddered approach, continuing resolution, but there's no poison pills, there's no cuts. It is a clean stopgap measure, it just has two dates on it. Is the White House making, optically, a little bit of a mess of this? Yeah, I, you know, I do, it was curious over the weekend, um, just the, the messaging from the White House, as you point out, where they kind of poured cold water over this. They called it extreme and irresponsible. Um, at the same time, uh, Majority Leader Schumer in the Senate uh, said that this actually could have been, could, was not so bad. It could be a lot worse um, because for the very reason that you point out, it does not include spending cuts. It doesn't include any sort of policy riders that would have been anathema to the majority of the Congress. Um, so I do think there there is a little bit of a messaging misfire here but again, I think the bottom line here, and I think it's important, instructive that Biden did not say that he would veto it. 
And I don't think he would. Uh, again, if you're just thinking of what members are facing here, particularly in the House, folks have been in session for 10 weeks. That may not sound like a lot of time for all those of us who usually work a five-day work week, but for members of Congress to be in D.C. for that long without going back to their constituents is a very long time. They are eager to go back uh, to, you know, to their districts. And so this is a way to allow them to go back for the entire holiday. So again, I think that Biden will have a lot of pressure on members in both the House and the Senate to pass to sign this thing. And I think as a result, he um, he did not he did not veto. He did not he did not threaten a veto, which is, you know, again, not surprising. I need to ask you about Moody's, Libby. We're obsessing over whether we can fund the government for a couple of weeks here, basically uh, through the end of the year is what we're talking about. But of course, that downgraded outlook uh, got some attention at the end of last week. This is Moody's downgrading our outlook uh, to negative here. And they said the key driver was the downside risks to the U.S.'s fiscal strength increasing. That part won't change. And as we enter potentially a protracted debate over real government funding at the beginning of next year to fund our government for the, the next year, I wonder if what we're about to see leads to a real downgrade. What do you think? And so this is something that we've been talking to clients because this in many ways, what we're talking about, Joe, and you know, we like to obsess over the, you know, the machinations in Congress, understandably, because um, we're policy nerds. But the real, the big issue for spending is not what Congress is quibbling about. That's what's called mm -hmm. discretionary spending. That's just a quarter of the government's budget. The balance- well, We're not gonna mess with entitlements budget, in this debate, are we? And that's, that is the issue. And so that is what we're telling clients is that for all of this noise coming out of Washington, the big elephant in the room is around Social Security and Medicare. And unless uh, folks come from both sides of the aisle, uh, really do something about those programs, our fiscal position will not be any better. So for all the, again, all the quibbling around, mostly about non-defense discretionary spending, which is only about 12 and a half percent of the budget, and the real issue is on is on, on entitlements. And of course, as you know, both Democrats and most Republicans view that as the third rail. They are not going to politically mm -hmm. take that on. The polling is very clear. So it's a long way of saying that while you know Moody's might be uh, sort of responding to some of the kind of the political dysfunction that's been happening on, on Capitol Hill over the last few weeks and months, you know, the big issue is really around entitlements. And I think they're they're right to point out that the political dysfunction and the sort of the short term means that there is less sort of political willingness to come together to address these longer term issues. But it's not around discretionary spending, which is what we read about in the headlines. Again, it's really around yeah. entitlements and making some commonsensical reforms to those entitlement programs. Absolutely. Discretionary spending is just a small piece of this pie. Libby, just very quickly, talking about nerds, I mean, it feels like Moody's at the moment, maybe, I'm not sure if you saw this, but it's almost like they're trolling the Capitol, the District of Columbia. They decided now to cut the outlook um, to negative from stable of Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia, because it reflects the district's unique exposures, the nation's capital, the federal government. What do you make of this? <laughs> I mean, a little bit. Now, Mark Sandy, who's their chief economist, um, has been sort of a, an implicit advisor to the Biden administration. So they definitely, the White House definitely has some friends over there. Um, but I do think this is, you know, as you all know, Moody's is the last uh, large credit rating agency to have not downgraded the U.S. government. They still have a triple A rating, although their outlook is unfavorable. Um, whereas, you know, as, whereas Fitch and other credit rating agencies have downgraded. So I think in some ways, yeah. Anne Marie, this is probably just reflective of their being on their back foot. Um, I do think, though, importantly, I don't expect it. We don't expect necessarily a downgrade. We'll see. But it doesn't seem like a downgrade is necessarily imminent. It's more of just a warning shot across the bow than anything um, than I think leading to necessarily a, a downgrade, at least in the, in the very short term. All right, Libby, thank you so much for joining us. Libby Cantrell, PIMCO Head of Public Policy. Up next, we're going to look at the CPI report coming out tomorrow. This is Bloomberg.
is the balance of power on Bloomberg TV. Arguably the most important economic data, at least for this White House, is out tomorrow. U.S. CPI and joining us around the table is Bloomberg's Enda Curran. Enda, tell us, what should we be focused on tomorrow? It's a really critical reading tomorrow. It's either going to inf confirm that inflation is turning to disinflation, which would be very good news for the government, or maybe it confirms that the great disinflation story is already coming to a pause. Experts are talking about keep an eye on airfares, mm. keep an eye on rents. Keep airfares on... have been high. They have, yeah. There was, there was a hint of a decline, but there's some feeling that it, perhaps with the time of year that it is, there might be some upward pressure again. But also there's going to be a quirk from medical insurance getting reset again. That's going to feed into the headline number. So remember last week, Chairman Jerome Powell came out with a bit of a stinging reminder that you know the inflation story isn't over yet. They could yet raise rates again if they need to. So I think if tomorrow's inflation number is surprising the upside, it will just stoke the idea that the, the great Fed uh, rate hiking cycle is not yet over. So this is why the stakes are high, and you frame that pretty nicely for us. What's going on with, with the, the medical insurance impact? Because I suspect if you're telling us this, the market is anticipating that as well. Will it that is, be factored in? Yeah, it, they, they look to it. It's medical insurance gets reset once a year or at certain points of the year, mm -hmm. so that will contribute to the overall headline number. It's not just medical insurance. Other things during the year get reset as well. But the yeah. point is it will contribute to over, uh, headline inflation looking faster than it is. To your point, the markets might look through it and say, look, Fed will have anticipated that they'll be, they'll be expecting it. But, you know, again, when you take it all together, and if the other components, as I say, are also showing a bit of upside pressure, right. then it just makes it a harder case to say that the disinflation story remains intact. And that makes it much more harder for this administration. Much harder. And as I said to you, the Fed last week making the warning that interest rates may yet go up. And, of course, the government in the White House obviously want inflation to be heading in one direction, heading into the all-important year that they have next year. I wonder what it also does to the consumer psyche... Before you go into Thanksgiving, before you go into Christmas and the right. holiday season, if you see there's a bad inflation report, how concerned are you going to be about spending? We saw the Michigan consumer inflation in expectations last week soaring to uh, high since 2011. Consumer confidence is at a five-month low. There's no doubt consumers are feeling the weight of inflation, even as it does cool off from the highs where it was last year. They still are feeling the pain in, uh, when they come to paying for their goods. Well, this is actually hitting, to your point, uh, the, the same week we're going to get earnings from the major retailers. So this whole story is about to be rewritten again the next couple of days here. Uh, there is a fear this comes in a bit hotter than expected based on what you're saying then, huh? There is some concern, and, uh, and that will again stoke the whole interest rate story. But remember, we're at a time of year when people are spending a lot of money, right. people are traveling. It's a pretty important time of year for the consumer story in the U.S. So if they are spending money well now at the moment and the find inflation story, that's a good sign. Well, we're about to fill in a lot of blanks. I wonder if the White House has two statements already written. But airfare is correct. <laughs> Flights to D.C., New York are even expensive. It's a 45-minute flight. This, this doesn't sound personal at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Marie. Our thanks to Bloomberg's Enda Curran, as always. We'll have a lot more ahead on Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. President Biden said today that Gaza's hospitals, quote, must be protected. This is Israel raids into northern Gaza, and those raids continue. Let's bring in Israeli economy minister, Nir Barkat. Minister, thank you so much for joining Bloomberg Television. The president also, speak to reporters today, said he, quote, hopes and uh, his hopes and expectations that there will be less intrusive action with the military around the hospital in Gaza City. He's calling, he's talking about al-Shifa. Uh, Do you agree with President Biden? Do you think the is IDF could maintain uh, that civilians are not being caught in the crossfires at this critical hospital? Well, Anne-Marie, thank you for hosting me. Um, let's look at the wider picture a second. We're dealing with monsters, monsters of Hamas, ISIS, that just killed uh, 1,400 Israelis, took 240 uh, um, uh, prisoners. Um, uh, they abducted children. I have a picture here of some of the children, the children. Uh, over 30 of them are less than 16 years old. We have no idea what's going on with them. We don't know if they're fed, if they're alive. We know nothing. Now, these savages decided they want to wipe out Israel. If they had the choice, they, they would do what they did to the 1,400 Israelis and, and the 239 uh, um, uh, hostages. They would do it to all of Israel. This is how we're dealing with. Now, those uh, monsters are hiding underneath the ground, under the hospital, because they know that we, and the, like the Americans, 
care about people's lives. They know this is a weakness. They're using a weakness and hiding behind civilians. This is what we're talking about. And we want to make sure that we wipe out these monsters off the face of the earth. And, and it's challenging, but you, we are, and, and, and we know that America is on our side. And I want to thank the president, President Biden, for the huge support we've been receiving. At, on, on this point, we need to take those, those, those monsters off the face of the earth. Minister Barkat, of course, we understand uh, your view on that, but there are great concerns for Palestinian civilians who are living uh, around what you call monsters. And I think Anne Marie was trying to get to your posture on protecting civilians in that hospital or, or throughout Gaza. We know. We gave them a, a corridor to go to the southern part of Gaza, where they, have, uh, uh, with the, with the, where they receive help from uh, the international community. We've given them opportunities to go. The Hamas uh, monsters, ISIS, don't let them go. The Hamas monsters went into Israel to kill, rape, rape our women. They put the children, the baby, in the oven as it was, when it was alive. They beheaded people. They burned people alive. They're, they're, and they were, pride of the, they were proud of it. They have uh, all those videos that they're proud of what they do. Now, we will do everything we can to make sure that innocent civilians don't get killed. We, we, we like America, share the same values. Understood. And but so, that helps to answer the question, Minister, and we, we do appreciate that. We'd love to ask you as well and put a finer point on the debate that's happening here in Washington. I know that you're going to be headed for the nation's capital at some point soon, and lawmakers cannot seem to agree on how to package funding for Israel. It's, it's been uh, more of a procedural matter, as I'm sure you understand. And I'm wondering how much time there is here to get this done, what Israel needs, and how much time there is to deliver it before this becomes a detriment? Well, there's a bipartisan support, and we acknowledge and we agree, and we're very thankful. We don't take it for granted, and we really want to thank the American people and the American leadership uh, on, on the support. This is very meaningful for us. Take your time. We, uh, the only thing we can do is make sure and, and, and that you understand that we have to wipe uh, uh, ISIS Hamas off the map, and we will do it with minimal collateral damage. This is our values. We don't need to be uh, uh, told that. We know that ourselves. We're Jews, and we care about life, un unlike uh, our enemies that want death and destruction, not only for Israel, not only for Jews, for all non-Islamic jihadists. They want to wipe us off the map. We're, the same. We're, we're fighting not only our war. This is a war of good against evil uh, between the West and, 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 and the jihadists that want to wipe us off the map. And, and it's headed everywhere uh, your way. I mean, we're on the same line, everyone. The Europeans, the Americans, Israelis, we're in the same line. We have to defeat Hamas. We have to defeat the regime in Iran that sponsors uh, Hamas and uh, Hezbollah in the north. And we'll do it together. Minister, do you think Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu needs to answer for the security failures, though, that happened on October 7th? We're not dealing with that right now. We're focusing on how to win the war. Uh, naturally, after the war, uh, we'll have those interrogations and we'll, ma we'll take responsibility. The government will take responsibility. But this is not, we're not focusing on that. We have to put all of our energy to defeat those monsters of Hamas. Also, Prime Minister Netanyahu has pledged to create an economy under arms. You're the economic minister. What are the key elements of this approach? Is it going to be like COVID? Because we understand, obviously, Israel, one of their major factors of their growth is tourism, which cannot happen right now. Well, we have 60% uh, debt to GDP, which is one of the best in the world. Um, COVID, we rose to 70% GDP. And within two years, we went back to 60%, which is, uh, again, we entered this war in really good macro conditions. Um, right now, we believe the debt would be anywhere to between 25 to 3% GDP, uh, which is something that we could bear. Um, and and that, that's not, this does not include the help we're getting from the, the U.S. administration and the United States, which we're very thankful for uh, combating the war, getting the right uh, arms and ammunition. Um, and I think that what you're going to see immediately after the war, you're going to see a boost of entrepreneurial uh, new startups, new, new innovation in Israel. That actually happens after every war. So I'm very, very optimistic that we will exit uh, this war 
in a huge boost. This is time to invest in Israel. The people that are smart, this is time to start investing in Israel. Minister, thank you. The Minister of Economy in Israel, Nir Barkat, we appreciate your insights today on Bloomberg. Coming up, we'll take a turn to domestic politics. A lot more to talk about there with the race for the Republican nomination for president losing one more name. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. Mr. Scott, anything you'd like to add? I have a girlfriend. <laughs> Okay. Uh, listen about her. She is real, and I know her, and she is my girlfriend, and we met through dating, and for her, I feel a real sense of human love. Is that what made him do it? That's from Saturday Night Live over the weekend, the cold open, then 24 hours later, out of the race. For more, we bring in our political panel, Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University. It's great to have you both here. Uh, Trey Gowdy was certainly blown away by this one, Rick. Uh, I, I, but I'll just bring everyone back to conversations we had last week. Senator Tim Scott was the name I heard every time we asked who might drop out next. So maybe the timing was curious. Are you surprised by his decision? Uh, I'm only surprised by the surprise of his decision, okay. right? I mean, like, he clearly didn't tell <laughs> anybody yeah. until he got on that show. I mean, like, why wouldn't you call your friend Trey Gowdy, who have you known your entire yes. political career, and say, hey, buddy, I'm coming on your show tomorrow, and I'm going to withdraw from the race, so don't look shocked. <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> no, it didn't. It almost so, felt yeah. like Trey was actually trying to convince him to reverse his decision live I, I think I think he was just in a state of shock. I mean, real news doesn't happen on his television show, so <laughs> the fact that it happened probably shocked him just as much as the, uh, the announcement well, itself. But it didn't shock any of us, right? He's out of money. He's out of support. Yeah. He's going nowhere in the polls. He's got no organization in Iowa. Uh, really, I mean, it's, it, it, it was actually very well-timed on, on his part. Mm -hmm. Frankly, he probably would have been having trouble getting into the next debate. Uh, Chris Christie, Maybe next. He, I hear his campaign's having trouble getting into the next debate. Mm. If you're not on the debate, you ought to get out. That's how it happens, I guess. Jeannie, everyone's looking to uh, someone else from South Carolina as to where the money might go, where the support might go. Is that Nikki Haley? It is Nikki Haley. You know, it wasn't only Trey Gowdy surprised. It was his staff. It was people who work for him. It was strange. But I will say Saturday Night Live is onto something because the girlfriend thing was one of the most Googled things after that debate. So <laughs> apparently that doesn't keep you in the race. But, um, you know, Nikki Haley really probably will be the beneficiary of, of this. You know, the poll numbers being what they are, about 3 percent, that's not going to get her a lot. But really the donor pool. We've already heard that there is going to be a fundraiser from one of Tim Scott's um, supporters for Nikki Haley. Other people are looking at her. So she will benefit. But, you know, one interesting aspect of this is while Nikki Haley appointed Tim Scott, they have had a pretty icy relationship throughout the campaign. Everybody seems to love Tim Scott. This turned icy. So it'll be curious to see what he ends up doing by way of endorsement because, you know, he has a, a a megaphone here, not huge, but it's important in the Republican Party. Yeah, at the moment, it does seem like he's keeping that endorsement close to the chest, or poten potentially he's going he's to wait a very long time for it. Um, Jeannie, I want you to take a listen to what Senator Chris Murphy had to say regarding a Manchin third-party run on Meet the Press over the weekend. Worried about him running as a third party candidate. If he does, he probably draws more votes from Donald Trump than he does from Joe Biden. Jeannie, what do you make of that? Should the White House be worried about a third party with Senator Manchin? Well, you know, we know they were because they did try unsuccessfully, obviously, to keep Manchin running for that seat. And Donald Trump, on the other hand, was trying to ensure that Jim Justice runs and that p pushes out, you know, pushes out the senator, which it did. So we do know the White House does care about this. That said, I am not convinced after this listening tour that Joe Manchin is going to run. He doesn't seem to want to play second fiddle. No label said they'd have a report 
Republican at the top of the ticket. And I know he does not want to be responsible for getting Donald Trump into the White House. But that said, the, the administration should be concerned about third parties, not necessarily Manchin. But I think Jill Stein is a big threat, as she was in 2016. And of course, RFK Jr., who was polling pretty strong, you know, they have to worry because these swing states are so tight any amount of support from those third party candidates can change the electoral college and do real damage to the Biden administration as they campaign. Well, one of the big uh, headlines to pop over the weekend as well was not about the presidential campaign, but the race for governor of Virginia, Abigail Spanberger, the congresswoman who's been on this program before, uh, made the announcement. She said she was considering it and it's real. We get a taste of the ad here. No more using teachers and our kids as political pawns. It's about focusing on recruiting and retaining teachers so all of our kids can succeed and stopping extremists from shredding women's reproductive rights. Even in this moment of deep division, we can seize the opportunity. I am running to serve all Virginians in every community across our Commonwealth because it's about time we do what's right for everyone. Shredding women's reproductive rights, an interesting approach and certainly a different one than Glenn Youngkin uh, was taking. Remember, he was talking about a 15-week ban uh, ahead of the elections last week. Rick, you know a lot about Virginia politics. Does the congresswoman have an early lead? Uh, I think within the Democratic primary, sure, the mayor of Richmond's talking about getting in the race. Uh, he's got a lot of support uh, about the way downstate. She's it in this ad? You know, I think she's framing it uh, consistent with uh, the other uh, commercials and what she's done in Northern Virginia. You know, Northern Virginia is a swing district. Mm -hmm. I mean, her district is very tough. She's done an amazing job of keeping it in Democratic hands. And I think by exiting the stage now, she gives somebody else the opportunity to try and fill in that spot. But uh, she will definitely be seen as one of the more progressive Democrats, you know, running for the nomination. But my guess is it's going to be a competitive field. You know, uh, Governor Youngkin cannot run by constitutional yes. standards for reelection. So it'll be a nice open seat hmm. and uh, could be a good year for Democrats nationwide, depending upon what's happening at the uh, at the presidential level. Especially in Virginia, given its proximity to Washington, D.C. Uh, speaking of women's reproductive rights, RNC Chair Ronna McDaniel spoke about the Republican stance on abortion when she appeared also on Meet the Press over the weekend. I actually think the numbers in Virginia are going to bear that out with the higher turnout. Where they spent the money, though, is the issue. Democrats spent on abortion nine times to one for Republicans. And this is my point of, if you are letting them define you, they had ads going up saying, we're going to ban everything, uh, no, no exceptions for rape, life, and incest. That just isn't true. Jeannie, Republicans, uh, Ronna McDaniel there, saying that Democrats were spending nine to one on abortion. But it worked in Ohio, in Kentucky, in Virginia. Is that the play for 2024? That is a big play for 2024. It worked the other day, last Tuesday. It has also worked in, in 2022, and it has been a winning strategy since Dobbs, the Dobbs decision. So they are going to pursue it. Republicans have a real challenge on their hands. I keep saying, I look at 24, it is going to be abortion versus crime and security at the border. And whoever can make the biggest play on that has a very good shot putting the economy aside for a minute. And we heard over the weekend Donald Trump going heavy on security crime in the border. Democrats will continue to do the same on abortion. And you just heard hints of that in Abigail Spanberger's commercial. Certainly have. Coming up, we're going to stick with our political panel, talk about the Supreme Court. It's responding to the stream of ethic controversies the court has recently faced. We'll dive into all that next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. The Supreme Court is adopting a code of conduct for the very first time, which places a spotlight on the justices' friendships and financial dealings. Let's welcome back our political panel, Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University. Thank you both for joining us again. But, Joe, quickly, mm -hmm. I don't really understand what's happening here because <laughs> it's a, quote, codif codification of existing principles. So the yes. principles already exist. That's right. 
It's not only laws they need to abide by. It's just, no. quote, principles. There's no penalty here if they were to not abide by those principles. And there's no uh, avenue for anyone to file a complaint. So we're kind of right back where we started in ProPublica, right. it feels like. So, Jeannie, what do you make of this? Because Sheldon Whitehouse, the Democratic senator from Rhode Island, he says it's a long overdue step by justices, but a code of ethics is not binding unless there's a mechanism to investigate possible violations and enforce the rules. So are we going to see Congress continue trying to do something when it comes to this? Yeah, I don't think this is going to settle the matter for Congress. Sheldon Whitehouse, we already heard Dick Durbin came out and said, you know, essentially the same thing as Whitehouse said, which is this is a step in the right direction, but at least at his first read, it does not go far enough for the reasons that you and Joe were just discussing. Number one being there is no enforcement mechanism, and so there is not even an area or an avenue for people to complain. So it, it looks to be diluted, watered down, weak attempt at, at sort of, I think, moving away from and trying to, if lack of a better word, tell Congress to mind their own business and be quiet. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's going to work. I think Congress will still keep pushing on this as long as Democrats control the Senate. And the, the Supreme Court, I think, did itself a disservice by not making a more serious attempt at a code of ethics here. Rick, we knew that they were talking about it. Some of the justices had mentioned that. In fact, in August, uh, Justice Kagan said, you know, maybe we'll take care of this on our own and take it out of Congress's hands, which maybe they have just done. But what could Congress have done here anyway? Yeah, there's a limit to uh, congressional authority over this. They can weigh in for federal judges because they actually mm -hmm. govern federal judges. They confirm them. They have a lot of rights associated with that. Yeah. They have no rights associated with the Supreme Court. I mean, there's nothing in the Constitution that says Congress can make laws that govern the Supreme Court. And so the Supreme Court is on its own. They are more worried about the public's acceptance of what they're doing than they are Congress's acceptance of what they're doing. That's why they call it separation of powers. So this was geared toward getting the public to feel like they're doing some internal uh, controls. Uh, but it's getting pretty widely panned, so my guess is it'll yeah. probably backfire on them. So it sounds like what you're saying is that they were doing this to maybe placate to the public, put a statement out and say, we have looked at this, we're going to have this new conduct, which is basically our other principles, but now we've written them down and we all signed a piece of paper for it. But the public's not going to buy it. Yeah, it just depends upon how much traction this gets. I mean, look, they are becoming less popular. Be if you are less popular as an institution of government like they are, mm -hmm. then the things you decide don't have the weight that they used to have. So this is a very important thing on a macro basis about the institution itself and whether or not it's going to have the credibility to be able to Im Im impose the rule of law, which is their job. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not an insignificant thing, but I think they didn't really take this very seriously, right? I mean, like, it's so easy to just look at this and say, there's no enforcement mechanism. There are no rules that they have to do. And by the way, there's no punishment if they violate the rules. Well, there's also no complaint system that applies to other judges, exactly. federal district judges. Right. Uh, so they're really operating on a totally other, a totally new yeah, level. The garden walls are, are still going to be pretty high here. Jeannie, Dick Durbin may not let go of this bone either way, though, because it's good politics, right? Could we, we're going to have hearings throughout the year on this as Democrats beat the drum? It, absolutely. I think they will continue, and I think rightly so. Again, you know, it's putting Congress aside. The Supreme Court is in a position, and any time historically they get out of step with public opinion, they lose legitimacy. They are at their lowest approval rating in decades. They should take this seriously for their own sake. And, you know, they do have to be a bit concerned about Congress. Let's be clear. Congress has the power of the purse. They do have checks over the Supreme Court. And the last thing that the Chief Justice wants is people being subpoenaed and called in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee because the court can't manage their own house. It is not good for the court. So they really should have taken this a lot more seriously. And I think from the beginning, the Chief Justice has been frustrated by anybody looking over mm -hmm. his shoulder, and he is paying for it now. All right. Great conversation as always, with our openers, I guess, today. Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano, great to see you both. And thanks, as ever. Check out the Washington Edition newsletter on the terminal and online. Yes, thanks for joining us on Balance of Power. Joe, I'm headed out of here tomorrow. Safe travels. I will not see you, but I'll see you on the other end, attending yeah. the Biden-Xi summit. We're going to be seeing you and hearing from you, though. You're not going away for real. Yeah.
Just uh, from San Francisco. Biden and she and Anne Marie. We'll see you back here tomorrow. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. <laughs>